Let's move forward a little bit. The International League Against Epilepsy uh, promulgated a, a new classification of both seizures and epilepsy in 2017. Uh, what are the advantages of these and when do you use it? And perhaps I'll lead off with a case, uh, ask uh, Dr. Resnick to uh, st start this discussion. So a 16-year-old comes into your office and he, the story is he was sitting in class and suddenly he fell out of his chair and he was observed to stiffen and shake all four limbs for a minute or two. Although, of course, they said it lasted hours because right. it seems like it lasts hours. Uh, how do you classify someone with that sort of a history and wh where does the new classification help you? So, well, let's start with the classification first. I think the classification is an improvement because it's much less ambiguous. The, the definitions are much more clear, um, uh, much simpler, much easier to define in terms of trying to classify a specific seizure. In terms of the case that you ask me about, that unfortunately is a very common scenario where the history that you get is consistent with a patient who has a generalized seizure. Uh, however, first of all, um, often with parents, the symptom that the parents see and that freaks them out the most is the fact that the child is jerking all over. They don't remember to tell you about the fact that the child may have been staring for a few seconds before they start jerking. And the reason is because it's not as emotionally effective as the generalized jerking. So I think it's very important, first of all, that when you get a history, and the only history is that the patient is jerking all over, to always go back and ask whether anybody noticed anything else prior to the jerking occurring, because that's definitely very helpful and is suggestive of a seizure that may be focal at onset and then becomes generalized. But frequently, even if you go through all that, you still don't know. Uh, and under those circumstances, you need um, other additional testing to help you out, um, such as EEG or imaging studies, as to what the true etiology is and what the true seizure type is. Eric, do you think the classification makes it easier for the neurologist and the non-neurologist to understand what we mean when we talk about seizures? So do you find complex partial seizure different than focal impaired awareness in terms of conveying a message? And do you think over the long run there will be an advantage to something like that? I definitely applaud the effort to simplifying the classification because definitely, like Trevor says, it's less likely to make mistakes when we document and communicate among us. So in the past, the, the classification was good. Unfortunately, many times we misinterpret or misuse the terms. So one term in medicine that is commonly used like idiopathic to determine unknown. In epilepsy was more determined for genetic epilepsies where we didn't know the gene yet. So we knew the theology, not exactly the gene. And then cryptogenic, we apply it more for the unknown causes, which in other areas of medicine, they use the term idiopathic. So that created a lot of confusion. So now the same with complex or simple is the same as using eponyms to describe the C's or call them like they are. So when you said someone has a focal on set, it's very clear that it's not generalized, it's still partial. And when you say there's impairment of awareness or not, it's absolutely clear. So I think that definitely the new classification is, is clearer, less likely to be misused. And uh, it still leaves us the option because not in every case we'll have the answer to say, we don't know. Hopefully we won't use that very often, but, but the option is there. Kate. How does this classification help in, in the real world, though, in practice? Does it make a difference? I do think it makes it easier for patients to understand the different subtypes of epilepsy using the new classification. It is confusing for patients who have had long-standing epilepsy and we're changing the names, but over time, I think it is an improvement. And it may help us decide upon treatment as well, I guess, right? Because that fundamental distinction between an absence seizure, for example, and focal impaired awareness, uh, the drugs may be somewhat different, although with the advent of more broad spectrum agents, uh, it, it, it's a little less challenging for non-absence type seizures, I suppose. Uh, and then when we classify the epilepsies, there are a number of domains that, we, that have been brought into it now that, as a way of thinking about it from a syndromic perspective. So does anybody have any comments about how that makes a difference and helps? 
new way of thinking about epilepsy, or was that something for the benefit of the panel that created the system and, <laughs> and not for the rest of us? I volunteer to take that too. Uh, the, the, so the syndromic cases, even though it's not a specific etiology, in many cases for the patient, it gives you an identity. So the best example would be Lennox Estot. So when you have Lennox Estot, any epilepsy may lead to that. There may be compounding factors, mainly having a childhood onset, having refractoriness to treatment, and uh, you can develop that syndrome. But it's very different the, the way you treat it as compared to just an epilepsy refractory to treatment where you can have drugs that make the epilepsy worse as compared to specific treatments for that type of syndrome. Uh, it also, in this new era, may open the possibility to have a third payer paying for that medication as compared to being rejected. So clearly the syndromes are uh, a much specific or more specific way to define the condition of the patient, and many times they are matched with the specific therapies. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think for, for, for me, in terms of counseling patients, being able to have a label of a syndrome is most important from the standpoint of prognosis and outcome. So you, you really have a much more focused ability to uh, talk about natural history and prognosis with the patient, and it provides a framework for them to understand it from a long-term standpoint. Uh, to Eric's point, for some of the syndromes, very specific treatment paradigms are, are very relevant. Um, so I think those two areas are, are very helpful um, when you're able to discuss a syndrome with a family or a, parent, or a patient.